So I was 19 years old. It was a winter retreat in Michigan at a place called Lake Ann Baptist Camp. If you're not from Michigan, yeah, Lake Ann Camps were located like right there. Those of you from Michigan are laughing. All right, there you go. <clears throat> I was uh, 19. I had been a Christian for just over a year, and we went to this thing called a winter retreat. Uh, winter retreat meant that we were getting away, setting apart some time. We were having worship experiences like we've had this morning. We're singing some songs. Somebody's preaching the word. We're focusing on our spiritual lives. We're doing it multiple days in a row, um, getting away from some of the other responsibilities of life. And it was December in Michigan. So December in Michigan. Um, sometimes here in North Carolina, I'll pray, God, give us a white Christmas. You know, it'd be great if the snow came down. It'd be like 70 tomorrow. It'd be awesome. In Michigan, when it snows, it starts in like July. It goes for like six months. Um, you're, just, you're just always, there's always snow. And so we're up there and we go to one of the sessions and the preacher, great job. You know, God's changing people's lives. And then afterwards, we go outside on these hills and we're not sledding, we're tubing down these hills. Yeah, and so it's everybody, too. It's like little kids are out there, um, grandparents are out there. I was 19, so like your bones don't break. It's like amazing out there. But being 19 also, I was an idiot. And so what ended up happening was I told you I was saved about a year earlier, and God radically changed my life. One of the ways he changed my life was this church family because I became a part of this group of people that weren't trying to get something from me. They actually wanted stuff for me. And if you haven't experienced that before, that's our desire for you and connecting with our church, and that was the first time I had experienced it. And I felt the same way about them. Like, I would never intentionally hurt any of them, but sometimes you do dumb things. And so what happened was, we're tubing on this hill, everybody's having a great time, and I thought to myself, as a, I'm just a curious person, and so I asked this question a lot in life, what would happen if... I've asked this since I was a little kid. It's often ended in pain, but I keep doing it. And so you call that whatever you want. And so I keep being curious, and I, I said, well, what happened? Well, how could we make this more fun? I grabbed my best friend. His name is Pete Munger. And I said, hey, what if we made a jump on this hill? Wouldn't that be incredible? And then we went to the youth intern. He was the guy that was like under the youth pastor. So the youth pastor a lot of times would get in trouble. This guy can do whatever he wants. But to me, as a new Christian, I'm like, he's a professional Christian. So I go to him, I'm like, hey, Tim. And I wrote Tim to make sure I was telling the story accurately this week. And I, I said, Tim, um, why don't we go make a jump on the hill? And he's like, yeah. Like he was into it too. I'm like, all right, this is a good idea. And so I've got community. We're checking it. I, they know the Bible better than me. And so we're just kind of going with it. And we go make a little bump on this hill where we estimated you would reach top speed and then we were excited to go right at ourselves 19 18 23 year old guys and then we look up and there's this woman coming over the hill linda gillespie linda is the nicest woman you could ever meet she serves voluntarily with teenagers and she has three teenagers talk about an amazing servant you'd never want to hurt linda and she's so excited as she begins her descent. She's literally, I remember pumping her arm. Yeah, let's go! And we realized at that moment we had made a mistake. <laughs> Linda comes down, she's picking up speed, and she hits, I call it a bump, her husband probably called it a launch pad, and she shoots. If you ski, you know what it is to have a yard sale. Your gear and everything goes everywhere when you wipe out. Linda goes in one direction, the tube goes in another direction. Oops! I couldn't remember if she broke her collarbone or her arm, and so I wrote her kids. I said, can you ask your mom? Because I don't want to ask her. And they just said, well, she doesn't remember the exact injury. I'm like, so nice. She's so nice. <laughs> she was hurt pretty bad. Hmm. Linda had no idea that when she began her descent, she was on a path of destruction. Today we're talking about a topic that is near and dear to God's heart as we continue our Relate series. We're talking about marriage. And if you survey the Bible, you'll notice the Bible begins with a marriage and it ends with a marriage. And there's a lot about marriage in between. And there are some topics that we oftentimes just cruise over when we're talking about marriage. And we're talking about one of them today. Uh, Pastor Mitchell, if you weren't in here when he opened the service, that it'd be an R-rated message. Uh, TVMA would probably be more accurate, just so you know. So if you have kids or you're bringing them in right now, I won't watch. Feel free to have them leave, please. And if not, don't be mad at me because I'm not going to change the message if you did not. So here's what's happened with marriage in our culture. We have begun a descent. 
some people think it's a great adventure. Not only are we arguing about who can get married and can two men get married and can two women get married and can you marry yourself and all those arguments. But if you look, all sociologists, regardless of their worldview, all the measurements they use will say that marriage is on the decline. Not just that less people are getting married and more people are cohabitating and the marriage age is later and there are more and more kids with single parents. Like All of those things are true. But what you see when you begin to see God's vision for marriage and the way that he planned it, that it was supposed to be what he calls a profound mystery. Oh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32, he says, after talking about marriage and how husbands are supposed to relate and how wives are supposed to relate, he quotes Genesis chapter 2, which we looked at in week 2 of this series, and we are just talking about relationships in general. And he says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. What started as a profound mystery has become a hollow ritual. And I wish, as I look back on that story with Linda, as she began her descent down the hill, that I had the foresight, courage to run on the hill and push the tube away from the jump. And that's what I hope that you'll want to do in your own marriage as our culture declines today. Because for real transformation to take place, it's not going to be legislation. It will not be yelling about how we disagree. It'll be by starting in God's house and in your house and in your bedroom and having the kind of marriage that God calls us to. And so, what we're going to be looking at today, anybody here spiritual enough to have brought two Bibles? Married couples, it's like a trick question. If you both brought a Bible, you got it. Boom, there's two or one, here we go. Anyway, uh, two passages of Scripture today. Never preached a message like this before. Told my wife yesterday it'd be ideal if this was a three-hour seminar. We could do Q&A. There's so much to talk about. So I'm going to cruise across the surface of a lot of these things, and you're going to have to dig in. I hope I leave enough crumbs that whets your appetite to want to dig into the Scriptures more. Somebody wrote me after the first service and said, can we have a marriage retreat? I'm like, sure, we can go to Michigan and tube. It'd be great. Um. The first passage is Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 24 through 25, and really we're going there because I want to make sure that we lay the guardrails down, the foundation for what's being said in a book called Song of Solomon, or some of your Bibles will say Song of Songs, after the book of Proverbs, it's in what the Bible refers to oftentimes the wisdom literature, and it's poetry. If you learned it in Sunday school as a kid, I bet you didn't learn the version we're going to talk about today. And some people will say, well, it's a picture of Jesus and the church. Well, Jesus hasn't come to earth yet. Church didn't even exist. I don't think that's true. Um, Ancient Jewish scholars used to talk about God's love for Israel. God does love Israel. And you do see throughout the Old Testament that his relationship with Israel is that Israel continually disobey, and he refers to it as spiritual adultery. And he talks about bride and groom language. And there's a lot of stuff going on in Israel now that I could talk about from that type of interpretation. I'm going to do a a video on YouTube this week, um, so you can go check it out, where I just talk about the, what's going on on these college campuses, and, all those, and Israel is God's chosen people. But it's nuanced. It doesn't mean you endorse everything they do, and so we're going to talk through some of those things. God does love Israel. And Christian interpreters that are uncomfortable with just talking about what the passage says will sometimes say, well, it's talking about Jesus and the church. God does love the church. And marriage does reflect his love for the church. And Ephesians 5 talks real clearly about that, but what if it means what it says? And so we're going to look at it from a literal, historic perspective today. Uh, The way the book moves is um, pretty controversial, so hot and steamy. Um, Some traditional uh, Jewish communities wouldn't let their young men read it until they were 12 years old because that's when you became a man. Oh, man! (laughs) If I was a man when I was 12, we were really in trouble. Uh, uh, But at any rate, um, it's really a song. And so it's poetic, and when you hear some of the words, you might even imagine, like when he's singing, which people debate about whether it's really Solomon, because if you read the whole Bible, dude had a lot of wives, and so is that ideal to be talking about? Um, Some people think just because it was in the wisdom literature, it's referred to the song in this vein of genre. Some people believe it's literally him. I don't know. Seems like it's him. Maybe the first one, when things went south, and the guy who tells his son, in the Old Testament. Avoid the adulteress, ruin your life, ends with a ruined life. Because he marries multiple women. They lead him astray. 
the Genesis foundation is um, it's not good for man to be alone. And we talked about that that second week and how God designed us for relationship from a macro picture. But when you zoom in on a micro, you see it's interesting that he didn't create for Adam a buddy, but a wife. The most intimate relationship that any of us ever have on earth, ideally at least. It's not just a contract or ritual or a way to get benefits. And that's in Genesis 2, 22 through 24. But I'm going to start reading in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Solomon's Song of Songs. Okay, so this is a song, and it starts off with this imagery, and it's her singing. So this, that alone would be controversial in a culture way before feminism, way before women had rights, way before any of that stuff. Women were considered property. Uh, the husband would sometimes pick, often the families would arrange marriages, but she's pursuing him. Look at what it says. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Some Baptists don't like that verse because kissing could lead to drinking. There's the problem. And so the very fact that it starts off called the Song of Songs, some of your Bibles will say that's the title of the book, or Song of Solomon, and those titles are added later, but in the inspired scripture, verse 1, we're told it's Solomon's Song of Songs. What does that even mean? It's one of the greatest songs ever written. When we read Song of Solomon, it's interesting, this poetic language, uh, you could moralize or prudishly come at the word love and think it's agape, it's this unconditional. Uh, probably the usage here is talking about having sex, love making. That's what's being talked about here. And he uses language like some of these songs that we would tell our kids, don't listen to that song. We don't be listening to it. Tasting one another and wine. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to read you the Song of Songs. You know how Jesus is called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? That means he's the greatest king. He's the greatest Lord. This is the greatest song of these types of songs. Billboard, sorry, Rolling Stone, God says. Solomon wrote over a thousand songs. 1,005 is the count that I read by most accounts. This is the one. This is the hit. And what you see here, and we're going to go through it, there's movements through the book. When you take a literal historic approach, what you see is there's actually a story being told through this song. And, and it's like she sings, she's got words for a boy. And he sings, words for a girl. And then they're telling a story the whole time. In the first three chapters, it's before they're married. But they're not shy about their passions and desires for one another. There's a sexual tension. And that's going to be where our first point comes from today. And then the, the second movement is the wedding night. And so it gets very erotic. And then the third part is the maturity of the marriage because there's problems in paradise and it always happens after the honeymoon. That's why. Your new job. Oh, you're in the honeymoon phase. That means you can do nothing wrong. Everything's great. Everybody's new. you new married. Honeymoon phase. But eventually the honeymoon wears off. So I know there's people, I'm doing premarital counseling with a couple right now. Everybody's like, not for us. Ah, it's because you're in it, all right? Wears off. Maturity happens. Um, we start here, and what we see, and this will be our first point here, is the pursuit of love. There's this longing for love. If you've never taken notes on a message before, I recommend you start today. Here we go. Um, we all have a longing for love. The reason why I started in Genesis chapter 2 is because that gives us a theological foundation for it, and it's Genesis 2.18. God created us that we're not supposed to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. Remember the theme on that message was good, 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 good. He created it was good. He created it was good. He declared it good. He saw it was good. But then God himself says, before sin, while Adam's in perfect relationship with God, not good. And he creates Eve. They didn't need a dating app. Didn't have to know if she was the one. There's only one. <laughs> Two people. And it's significant, and remember this for a little bit. They were naked and felt no shame. Hmm. But now there's sin. Is it possible to have that kind of experience again? It is. That's what Song of Solomon shows us. But what you see here is this woman starts off talking about his love, and it's intoxicating, like wine, the taste of this love. And then she goes on, and she begins to share her insecurities. Notice, it's poetic language, but don't, don't miss what's happening. Verse 5. I'm not going to be able to read all eight chapters, by the way, just because of time. I tried to read too many in the first service, so you're getting the Cliff Notes version. Here we go. Um, 
Dark am I, yet lovely. Does she have good tanning oil? Like, what does that mean? Um, notice it says yet. This wasn't a good thing when she's talking. And this is not about race. This is about her being out in the sun. That wasn't considered beautiful then. And she says, she's talking to some friends, daughters of Jerusalem. And so what's probably happening here is that she's probably already married to Solomon. She's reflecting back on when they first met. The book starts and she's already met him. And we get an idea in these verses how they met. Apparently he came like a shepherd, even though he's a king. Have you ever seen Undercover Boss? And so he comes down. And he meets her, but she wasn't ready for it. And she's apologizing about her appearance and about her family problems. So you've got a guy coming from royal family, the wisest man who's ever lived, the most famous person in their world, and she's not even ready. Look at what happens. Dark am I, yet lovely. Daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Keter. That was a Bedouin community. Uh, They would travel around and they'd have these tents that were made of black goat's hair, weathered and worn. There was nothing attractive about this. She's saying she's not attractive. Like the tent curtains of Solomon. He's got curtains where you enter his bedroom. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. Here's why she makes the excuse. My mother's sons, or stepbrothers, it's like a Cinderella story. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. Oh, so they made me do the work they should have been doing. They objectified her, used her. We're getting stuff from her, not for her. My own vineyard, this is most likely a metaphor for her own physical appearance now, I had neglected. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock when they met. And where you rest your sheep at midday, why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? Why am I treated just like another person? Ignore my insecurities. I'm sorry about my family. It doesn't measure up to your family. How does he respond? Jump over to verse 9. I liken you, my darling, so they're singing back and forth to each other, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. And it talks back and forth of this tension in chapters 1, in chapters 2, and in chapter 3, she has what appears to be a dream in verses 1 through 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to chapter 3 and verses 1 through 5. But what you're seeing through the whole thing is this pursuit of love, a pursuit that theologically we know is true. And I love it when science, social sciences, regular sciences, all start to catch up with what God's already said to be true. And that's what we're starting to see. I don't have to give you all kinds of statistics for you to know that most people, there are some people that have the gift of singleness, some people take a vow of celibacy, and we're going to talk about singleness in a couple of weeks. But most people, whether you're single or married, have this longing in the desire, the way that we're created, to be loved and to love And we want to see it fulfilled in a romantic love. And you see that through the novels that are out there. You see it through how popular love songs are and how many there are. You see when psychologists talk about a baby who's not held will have psychological damage. There's a need to be loved. And why is it that pornography is making so much money? Nobody's looking at it if you ask them. (laughs) Why? Are women buying so many novels about vampires and werewolves and pirates and billionaires and surgeons? Those are the popular ones, by the way. Pursuit of love. However, it's a hollow picture. It's got the outward forms of what should be, and it's lacking the content. It's like a dangerous decline, but they don't know the destructions at the end. It'll never meet what they're actually hoping to happen. Not just because we then make it into civil unions and talk about it like a contractual thing, but because it's been hollowed of the soul of what it is. And that's why you have to go back to Genesis 2 and verse 24, where it says, for this reason, what's the reason? There's a lot of reasons for marriage in the Bible. Companionship, sanctification, to reveal the gospel. There's a lot of reasons. Reproduction, procreation. Like there's a lot of reasons. What's he talking about? For this reason, a man will leave. But he's talking to Adam. He doesn't even have a mother and father. His mother and father, he's setting a precedent. God invented marriage. He gets to decide how it goes. 
There are only two genders, and it's between opposite genders. One man, one woman, they'll leave their other family, breaking those ties and a new allegiance, and cleave to, Hebrew literally, stick to, be glued to one another. That's important to remember because of the next statement, which is the foundation for all sexual theology throughout the Bible, and the two will become one. What is that oneness? The oneness is what you're longing for when you're looking for love. You were made that way, and the social sciences are starting to get closer and closer and closer if you read some of the articles and the studies. But lacking the theology, they'll never quite get there. So what is the oneness? There are some, even Christians, that will simplify it and dumb it down so much that it's just the consummation of the, the, the marriage on the wedding night. And it's interesting when you go through, almost all cultures have some kind of ceremonies and some of them, they don't stand in front of a you know, professional Christian and ask him to say stuff, and they say stuff and make commitments. But there's some ceremony. Sometimes it's a week long, there's celebrations. Read Jacob and Rachel in Genesis, I think it's 27. And you get these different ones, but almost always the kind of symbol, the seal, that this is official, is that when the two bodies that were designed by God to come together become one body and a sexual union, that at the very least people talk about that as oneness, but it's more. And if you keep reading through the Bible, you see that. It's a oneness in every way. Financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Which is why when God says what God has joined together, when Jesus quotes Genesis 2.24, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father, be united his wife, and the two will become one. Let no man separate what God has... So what did God do to join them together? Because... They put their bodies together, and they signed whatever contracts or did whatever ceremony. Your souls have been united. It's deeper than just a a contract. You hold up your hand, I hold my That's all hollowing out what was meant to happen here. That's why when Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 18, and he's talking about the body, and sometimes there's an idea about sex in our culture that it's just an appetite, and so you just feed the appetite. And we talk about sexual desire the same as like a food desire. We've got food issues. That's a different message. However, it is an appetite, but it's different than your stomach. That's why, in unpacking that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, would anyone unite Jesus to a whore? Because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in you. You're part of the body of Christ. And then you're going to go and have transactional sex and put your soul with somebody else's soul. Because people sometimes talk about all sins the same. No, it's not. Not according to the Bible. If you said that, you're probably well-meaning. You just didn't know. So let me tell you. There's a reason why 1 Corinthians 6 says all other sin. So this is a different category. Sexual sin is different. Because it's meant to be part of the oneness of marriage. And so it's not just, oh, don't be naughty. Stop it out. I'm going to shame you if you had sex outside of It's like, oh, no, you're missing what was intended. And if you keep doing that, you become hardened so you can't experience it. So what does it mean to be one? It's one in every way. I joke with my wife. So last night we were going to dinner with another couple, and I always say to her, she does not like me drinking her water. I say, did you grab our water? It's like, get your own water. Please, after the service, go to her and say, you should share your water with your husband. I've even tried to not go the biblical route so she doesn't think, stop with the pastor abusing the Bible verses that she says to me. I said, listen, honey, because she's a nurse. I said, "Um, we kiss and we exchange spit. Just follow the science. Like, we can drink the same cup. I probably should get my own cup. But at any rate, oneness is that you share everything. You've left an old family allegiance. You've begun a new one. And before we knew what DNA was, a kid, a mixture of the two individuals, oneness, science will catch up. I don't know if they'll ever get it without God opening their eyes. But your marriage is supposed to be a picture, a mysterious one. We all have the longing, but what happens next is pretty amazing. Sex is significant. That's our second point. There's a significance to sex. And here in this book, I can mention there's a lot of reasons for marriage. There's a lot of reasons for sex in the Bible. Procreation, we read that in Genesis. Comfort, we read that in Genesis. To avoid temptation, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're commanded uh, to not burn in lust. That is one of the reasons. 
Here we see, and in other places, pleasure, satisfaction. Reproduction is not mentioned, emphasized. Re- you can read all the verses. You can say, well, yeah, that's just because you're picking select verses. Read the whole book. If it, worst case scenario is you read the Bible. Um, but you, you see here, it gets real hot. Like they talk about their tension. Chapters 1 through 3, I mean, even in that pursuit, she has this dream, and she says, I took them to my chambers, my mother's chambers, like that's where they're going to have sex, they're going to consummate it. And then it's interesting, verse 5, then she pauses and goes, don't awaken love before it's time. Oh. And so what we have here in this next section, talking about their wedding night, and they talk about sex, um, I wrote, I sent all the notes and all the verses for the slides and stuff on like Thursday this week, and then Friday I got a text message from Pastor Dave, he was working on the small group curriculum finalizing it to send out to those of you who lead small groups and are in small groups. And he said, you didn't put a title on there. And I thought, oh, I didn't put a title on there. He said, how about you wrote, how to have hot sex? You know how when you text somebody and they're going to write back, it's like, dot, 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 dot. I'm like, all right, what's he going to say back to that? <laughs> and then I sent him several and I said, how about this? Call it sex, lies, and scripture. Because that's really what it's about. We're going to talk about sex and some of the lies of culture, but the way you combat lies is with truth. Same way as the best battle against darkness is light. So scripture, is truth and light. And it says here, sorry if you're prudish, sorry if you don't want to get all excited at church, sex is hot when you do it God's way. And what you see here, and there are more than three things, but I'm going to give you three secrets to hot sex in a Christian marriage. So if you've never taken notes in a sermon before, might be your chance. Now, some of you are excited. Some of you, probably the ladies are like, oh, God, there's a guy up there. We're going to get a homework assignment. Here we go. Here, we go. Here, we go. Here, we go. Here it is. First one is this. Uh, hot sex. My God. Uh, it's sacred sex. Oh, man, you just ruined it. No, no, no. Listen. This is important. Sacred means this. It's set apart for worship. You ever heard a pastor say, worship starts on Saturday night. Get to bed early. Come to church. Uh, worship can start on Saturday night. Read the book, Song of Solomon. Because worship's not just three songs that you sing before a sermon. Worship is not just bringing an offering to an altar. It's not just taking communion, getting baptized, some prayers you pray. Worship is even in the bedroom. That's what we're seeing here because that's why you've got that repeated phrase here that points out to us this principle. So single or not, not, Sex is right person, right place, right time. There's a repeated theme in Song of Solomon. I mentioned it in chapter 3 and verse 5. It says this in chapter 2. In the midst of their sexual tension and talking about all their desires and how each other taste and wine and legs and faces and daughters of Jerusalem. So this wife now reflecting back is saying to these other young women, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Until it is time, some translations, until it pleases, which is my favorite translation. Because the desire is always there. She's just talked about the desire. It pleases? It points to... Now, wait. You can have an orgasm without a person. But the pleasure that God's talking about in this can only be experienced in this way. Right person, right place, right time. Verse 5 in chapter 3 says the same thing. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires, until it pleases, until it's time. And the book even ends after they've had their marriage, the honeymoon's over, they've actually separated, then reconciled. Chapter 8, verse 4. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, Where'd the gazelles and the does go? Okay, but still same idea. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. But it always desires. There's a tension, right? There's reason. There's a reason to wait because the other stuff, it's like Linda coming down the hill. Yeah! It promises at the beginning. But... There's another erotic passage that I would point you to if you think that I'm misinterpreting Song of Solomon or you disagree, love to talk about it, it'd be great. But read Proverbs chapter 5. There's a father speaking to his son and he's warning. And, And the way the Proverbs go the whole time, all of the book of Proverbs is foolishness versus wisdom. 
Here's what wisdom is. Here's what foolishness is. Different word pictures, different language. Chapter 5 is talking to his son about sex. It's the talk. Proverbs 5, 3. Not Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which you'll find on a lot of t-shirts and a lot of posters. I dare you to hang this one up in your house. Proverbs 5, 3. People will be like, that must be a printing error. Okay, let's hear it. Proverbs 5, 3 says, For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey. Honey's good. And her speech is smoother than oil. Oil is a good thing. Verse 4. But in the end, she's as bitter as gall. Gall is what they gave Jesus on the cross when he asked for a drink. The Old Testament gall is associated with idolatry, the book of Deuteronomy. Then it's described as sharp as a double-edged sword. But the beginning, the descent, woo, let's go, lands in destruction. Interestingly enough, written by a guy, the wisest man in the world, ruined his life by not following his own advice. The message says it like this, the lips of a seductive woman are oh so sweet, her soft words oh so smooth, they promise a lot, but it won't be long before she's gravel in your mouth a pain in your gut, a wound in your heart. She's dancing down the primrose path to death. That's destruction. She's headed straight for hell and taking you with her. She hasn't a clue about real life, about who she is, where she's going. Let me paraphrase that. Son, don't do it. Trust me, I know. Why? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and it's his wife and the two. That's the oneness. You ever heard somebody say, just trying to find the one? The right one? Mr. and Mrs. Wright? Heard that language? Nobody? You're all just staring at me. Is that a good thing to say or not a good thing to say, Pastor? I don't know. What are you going to do next? Just ask if you heard it, all right? That is a misnomer that is dangerous, but it's like most deceptive things, so we're talking about lies, um, laced with some truth. A soulmate? Maybe you've heard it talked about that way. Does the Bible talk about a soulmate? Who's the one? The danger of that is this, is that whether you're using a dating app or meeting somebody at church or whatever it is, that however you meet, being a shepherd and shepherdess, and there's a chariot and you're really tan but you didn't want to be, like whatever, however you meet, how do you know? And the honeymoon does wear off, and the danger of that teaching is when the honeymoon wears off and things get tough, I must have married the wrong person. And it's easy to go back and go, ah, oh, mom was right. She's not good enough for me. Dad warned me. That's from the pit of hell. But the Bible does talk about a soulmate. Jesus, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6. He quotes Genesis chapter 2, interestingly enough. What God has joined together, he says, let no man separate. If you're married, that is your soulmate. But I've been married more than one. Who you're married to, that's your soulmate. Don't tear it apart. You'll cause your own heart great damage. Not to mention the shrapnel. And it's always messy. In fact, oh, I don't have time to get into the studies and some of those pieces, but... Uh, there's a long quote I was going to read you by Tim Keller. Maybe we'll post it on social media this week. I don't have time to read you the whole thing. The summary of it is, he says this. He says, it's interesting that even in the, he doesn't call it imitation sex, but imitation sex, the hollow version. People enjoy it, obviously, short term for the moment. But it's interesting the words people are tempted to say to one another that are marriage-like words. I will love you always. Never love somebody like this in the midst of it, in the wine, intoxicating moments of it. However, what happens is when you're doing it outside of that context that God has given us, the set-apart context of marriage, not awakening before, before it's time, outside of that, what ends up happening is it's always damaging to the person. Because you were made, unless you numb yourself, that this isn't just a transaction, not just an appetite you're feeding, it's not just an animal-like lust, then you expect some kind of commitment in return. But if you keep doing it, you have to, you must, the language that Keller uses is steal yourself. If you read some of the sociological studies, harden your heart. You have to harden yourself to the fact 
that you feel connected to this, so you don't feel connected anymore, so you can keep having the transactions. And what ends up happening is you reverse what's supposed to happen in the marital relationship, and you don't trust your spouse. Your spouse doesn't trust you because you've lost an ability to have a one soul connection. God has to heal that and restore that. And it starts by oftentimes dealing with a sexual sin that's either going on right now or has happened in the past and it can happen again. But the reason why Hebrew says the marriage bed is undefiled. What does that mean? Set apart. It also means that you guys, whoever you're married to, get to decide how it goes. Other than, bring, you know, don't bring in other people, not pornography, not like a, but it's yours. It's a, it's a sacred place for you. So hot sex is sacred sex. Right person, right place, right time. Right person is your soulmate, spouse. Right place, your undefiled bed. Right time, once you're married. And often after you're married. <laughs> How often? 1 Corinthians 7, we're commanded to do it and not to stop unless there's an agreement. I couldn't believe it when I got married and we had to talk about how often. I'm like, uh, every day? I don't write, wake up on my calendar. I do that every day. I brush my teeth. Like, what? Hmm. Uh, we'll get into why that becomes a needed conversation in just a moment. The second thing is, not only sacred sex, it's satisfying celebratory sex. Marital sex. The reason why it's hot sex is celebratory and satisfying. That same passage in Proverbs that talks about uh, not listening to the adulterous woman, it, the father commands his son in Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 19, may her breasts satisfy you, talking about your wife, you always. May your fountain, that's his male parts, be blessed. There's hot and erotic language in Song of Solomon here. Chapter 1, she talked about her insecurities. They go back and forth about what they love about one another. And then in chapter 3, they begin to consummate the marriage. Not only was she pursuing him, he was pursuing her. And you read about that in verses 7 through 11. And then chapter 4, listen to this. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb he talks about honey. There's no mention of gall because it's right place, right time. My bride, milk and honey are under your tongue. That's the taste of kissing her. Hey, Ed, you're onto something. <laughs> the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. I don't know what Lebanon smelled like. Must have been good. I was reading this book this week, looking for lines I could use on Shanna. There's one in chapter 7 where it says your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. I thought, not that one. There's some other ones, though. I encourage you to keep looking. <laughs> you are a garden. Another theme in this book, Genesis 2, is the garden imagery. We already saw the vineyard, that she's a shepherdess, that he's a shepherd, and now he's referring to you are a garden. Locked up, my sister, my bride. He's still got a pursuer. They've already been married. And you are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Well, why would garden imagery be important? Remember, naked and no shame? Hmm. Is it possible to experience that again? It seems. Chapter 5 is pretty hot. She says, I slept, but my heart was awake. That means, listen. My beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. What? Underline that for the next point. My flaw. He calls her perfect. She's a sinner. She's already said, here's my flaws. Chapter one. Anyway. Um, my heart is drenched, or my head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. It's probably raining. He's outside, is the image we get here. I have taken off my robe, she says. She's playing hard to get. Do I got to put it on again? Most men would say, nope. <laughs> uh, feet are often a euphemism uh, for sexual language. I don't have time to unpack all that, but it says here, I've washed my feet, she says. Must I soil them again? My beloved thrust his hands through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. There is debate about whether this is a literal door or that this is her vaginal area. He puts his hand there, but he 
waits for her permission to enter. She says in verse 14, his arms are rods of gold set with topaz. He's ripped. His body is like, this is talking about his abdomen, his midsection. Uh, Most English translations are pretty vague on this, but it's pretty clear what this is. Like an elephant tusk, a polished ivory decorated with, and my translation, I don't even know what this is, sapphire, some say, lapis lazuli jewels. So this is the male area with jewels. This is sensual. It's okay to enjoy sex. I told you people are trying to catch up. Sociologists, psychologists, they'll look. I, t- I said, you can masturbate and have an orgasm. And it's different than when you're having sex with your person. It actually does something different chemically in your body. So God, before time began, infinite in wisdom, living in perfect harmony in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, before Adam existed, before there was a person, knew that it wouldn't be good for him to be alone, but created him alone so that he'd realize the problem. Then gives, not a buddy, but a wife, for a reason. Oh, there's layered reasons. There's lots happening here. And then in Ephesians 5 says, so you can reveal Christ's love to the church. Wait, what? Jesus hadn't come to the earth. There was no church and God's infinite wisdom. Before we knew what DNA was, knew that when the two came together in one and then you'd have a child and be like, oh, you look just like your dad, but you got your mom's eyes. And now we start unpacking the DNA. Researchers are trying to figure out why is it that when you're with your person, there's a different response. Both release some tension and some stress. We know there's health benefits to having an orgasm. I read some articles on it this week. I assured my wife there weren't pictures in the articles. I'll tell Pastor John because he gets my accountability on my internet. That's what I'm researching for this sermon. All right? Let's go. Masturbation versus internet. Okay. <clears throat> Here's what you find out. Researchers say it's because when you're with another po- person, uh, the hormone oxytocin is released, and they call oxytocin the bonding hormone. Hmm. Well, you can unpack that and get into all the science of that. However, God's already told us the answer. Oneness. Hmm. But both help with blood pressure and both release, but not the same. One's more. And guys, I don't think this is a great line either. I went to see the doctor. I've got high blood pressure, honey. You know what helps? Probably a better way. But it can be hot. If it's the last point here, how does it happen? It's safe sex. And I don't mean like in the 90s and 2000s, you wear a condom. No, I'm not talking about that. How does a woman go from all of her insecurities in chapter 1 to talking about her door, his ivory tusk? He says to her, you're flawless. Hmm. She's not. She's a sinner. She's, I'm sure, I've never physically seen her, but I'm sure she's got physical things that are not perfect. To him, she is. And that makes her feel safe. He doesn't say in comparison to, or if you just had this color hair, or I wish you were a little bit tall. He's created an environment of safety. And you can go through and see all of the different words, and it's real interesting how they're serving one another and meeting each other's needs, and it's not a demand of, and I want you to... Here's what I see in you, and it's like their marriage, but it's undefiled. And what you see is, in this garden of their bedroom, a nakedness and no shame, because it's safe. So husbands, I would just ask you, have you made it safe? Do you know our needs? There is an interesting book... Again, don't have time to unpack a bunch of it, but it's called His Needs, Her Needs, A Fair Proof Your Marriage by a guy named Willard Harley. And he said to study where men are surveyed and women are surveyed and they list their needs. And we don't have a slide for this, so I want you to really, you can pay attention to this. I just want you to compare the two lists. Uh, men, number one need, asking all men, sexual fulfillment. Okay, applies to this message. I can use this. All right. Number two, Recreational companionship. Number three, for men, physical attractiveness. Number four, domestic support. Number five, admiration. Women, see if this list lines up. Affection, conversation, 
honesty and openness, financial support, and family commitment. Where was sex on the guy's list? Number one. Where was it on the woman's list? Not on the list. <laughs> and that's why we had to talk about how often. 365 days a year on leap year, we can stick with 365. How does that sound, champ? No. Okay. What do you think? And do you have to work it out? That's part of it. In fact, a significant part of the whole deal is communication. And that's one of the reasons why it's a celebration, because you're celebrating the communication that's already taken place. Guys, foreplay does not start when you start knocking on the bedroom door. Or even at 10 o'clock in the morning for what you hope happens at 10 p.m. at night. It's a constant. Did you hear her needs? Do you know her needs? Did you know that 50% of women that are surveyed say they fake orgasm? Does your wife? Not my wife. Why? Because you're awesome? Why don't you ask her? I dare you. Because if you start looking, and I've tried to figure this out too, but the numbers are all over the place. I don't even know what good number to give you. It's all, they're all high. Women that have never had an orgasm? Hmm. And I'm going to tell you how. Just kidding. We're out of time. Uh, Bryce, bring the band. Just kidding. Um, <clears throat> Bryce is like, thanks. Um, anyway. um, Song of Solomon sure seems like about some climatic moments and erotic experiences. And, and you're supposed to figure that out together. That's part of the process. You know what the reality is of what happens, though, in chapter 5, as hot as it is? She refuses him, and he leaves her. There's conflict. Chapter 5 and verse 2 He's gone. And she goes, and, and in the first scene when she's pursuing love, the watchmen of the city help her find him. In the second scene, chapter 5, they beat her, which is probably symbolic as she's singing this poetic song to us of the inner pain and turmoil she's experiencing as he's left. But they come back together. They reconcile. God can heal anything, just so you know. As I've talked through this message, some of you, um, maybe some of the ones that have a great marriage are just excited to go apply. <laughs> some of you have felt more shame than you had before you came in here today. That's not God's intention. But the way he deals with it is through forgiveness. If you'll confess. I mean, say the same thing about your sin that he says about it. He knows it happened. You know it It's not just listening to that. What did it do to your oneness with him? It broke it. Tear the barrier down. Say what, say what it was. That he's faithful. He's just. Not you've got to work it off, and now if you could just, and put all these good works to make up. No. He's faithful. He's just. He will forgive, and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Some of you need to begin a conversation with your spouse. What do you think of the message? Might be a good way to start. And then what they talk about, go with that. Think of those needs lists. What are your needs? Are you seeking to meet each other's needs or are you fighting to get your needs met? That is a big difference. Slight verbal change, significant difference. Let me read you this verse. It would be a tragedy to read Song of Solomon and not read this verse. After the reconciliation, place me like a seal over your heart. Oh, the oneness, the together like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Wouldn't sell it for that. Last week, Pastor Mitchell was talking about our relationship to the church, and you might hear this message this week and be like, I don't know, Pastor Scott just want to talk about sex. It doesn't really have anything to do with the vision. We talk about how we want to see spiritual transformation that leads to gospel saturation. A million lost people in our city. Not a million people, a million lost people in our city. We want all of them in the next 10 years to have an encounter with Jesus, and at least 100,000 of them to come to know him and be radical. Like I was radically changed, for them to be radically changed. Like some of you have been radically changed, like that. We don't have to come to church here, but we want them to have a family like that. They would want something for each other. What if God used, what if Southbridge was a place where healing from hurts, sexual hurts, marital hurts, 
happened? What if the people here, who none of us have it perfectly, but we're trying to, trying to have what God has designed us to have, we're living it out, and, and other people, your kids, because the next generation's leaving, and they see your marriage, your neighbors, go, I don't know what's going on in their marriage, but it's different, profound mystery. They'd be seeing the gospel. Ephesians chapter 5, there's eight verses for the man. Love your wife like Christ loves the church. 153 words in the English translation. For the wife, half of a verse. Ten words. Respect them. Did you, did you hear the list of the needs? <laughs> he wants admiration. She wants connection. Oh, our heads and close our eyes and talk to the Lord for a couple moments. God, thank you that sometimes we catch up to what you've already told us for millennia. God, will you, will you reveal yourself to people today in ways that I couldn't guess right now? Will you, will you reveal yourself through other people's marriages? Will you give people a desire for the marriage you desire for them to have? The ones that are single, that are going to be married someday, will you give them that vision? The ones that are married, and are, it's a hollow picture. Or maybe they're living like roommates in the same house, and everybody at church would never guess that it doesn't have. And maybe some people have just decided, like, oh, the passion just fades. Well, not if you keep pursuing. That's the picture you see in Song of Solomon. The pursuit number stops. You're not married to who you were married to on your wedding day. Some of you think that's the problem. No, the problem is you're not pursuing the person you are married to, your soulmate. Repent. Some of you make marriage too big of a deal. It's an idol. Repent. Some of you have devalued it. Repent. Restoration or revival begin at the point of repentance. Well, you have pain and wounds and some self-inflicted, some others inflicted. Maybe sexual sin. Maybe other sins. You've been hiding. Lack of trust. I don't trust everything right now, but could you start to build, take a step today? Could you pray for a moment, just tell you as a church, we want to be like family to you. We want to help you. I'm just going to preach this message and leave it out there this week. Uh, we've called several counselors in the area and connected with them and know about their availability and if you need financial resources we'd love to pay for you to go begin some marital counseling we have the budget for that we've set the money aside because people are generous on a regular basis here at this church it's basically your church family it's other people maybe the person you're sitting next to that's paying for you to go to counseling if you need that you gotta let us know you can come talk to us today at first steps which happened just a little bit go to the connection table in the lobby come up to any pastor or person that has a name tag that says i can help or you can use the qr code and the piece of paper that's on the seat back in front of you. If you're online, you can just write a note. Maybe we just want to pray with somebody. I'd love to pray with you. Some might want to study more, but you're not sure how to study yourself, and maybe you'd be interested in a study on marriage. We've got leaders on standby that would do that, but we're not going to do it just to do it, and so if, if enough people say they're interested, we'll do it. If you're interested, let us know. Use that QR code. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit's been moving up and down the aisles, moving in hearts. Some younger people did stay in the service. The desires are there. Also not to awaken them. Young people, I promise you, when I was a youth pastor, kids used to ask me, how far is too far? Should I? You won't regret saying no. But they might leave, and that's God's protection. That wasn't the right person. As much as you might want it to be, God's got a, you trust that he's got a good plan for you. Right person, right place, right time. You already messed up? You're not unusable. You're not, God's not done with you. But don't keep running down that path. Dangerous. He wants something for you. He wants for you what God wants for you. Already married, never shared. You don't have to hide. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name I pray.